Hi everyone. In today's episode, we are going to talk about server sent events in Go. In simple words, the server sent events is this cool little web technology that enables real-time unidirectional communication from servers to clients. In terms of client-side implementation, it's quite similar to web sockets, though the communication is only unidirectional, so only from the server to the client making it simpler to implement and well suitable for scenarios where you need real-time updates from server to the client, but client-to-server communication is not necessary. And there are some really good use cases for this approach. For example, real-time dashboards, live sports scores, um, any progress bar updates for long-running tasks, I don't know, market uh, trading updates, and etc. There are some advantages of using server sent events. For example, it's simplicity. It's a little bit easier to, to implement rather than WebSockets. Um, it's efficiency, so it keeps a single HTTP connection uh, between client and the server. It also reconnects automatically in case the connection is lost. And it's supported by modern browsers natively. So if you look at this M official MDN documentation, you can see that it's Quite easy to implement it on the client side using in JavaScript, for example, using the event source interface. Um, easily open the connection, receive the messages, uh, receive some specific messages, close connection. There is the example in PHP, so we'll be doing something similar in Go. And yeah, we'll be spending some time focusing on the fields of the event stream format. Um, in Go. So let's dive into code and build a server in Go, a client in JavaScript, and yeah, explore the main building blocks. So what we'll be building is some uh, CPU memory monitoring of our host machine. So our server will be sending these CPU and memory stats to the client, and the yeah, client will um, iteratively show the updates on the web page. So yeah, let's start coding. So we don't need any external packages. Um, the only package we need to use is standard libraries HTTP package. So we need just simply to run our server and create a handle func. So let's do that. So let's call the path would be, or the route would be events and some SSE handler that we'll define later. And HTTP, uh, listen and surf student port 8018 something like that now let's go and implement our handler, which always has these two arguments, um, response writer and HTTP reader, uh, sorry, request. Now the first thing we need to do is to set the correct response headers, and that would be um, content type, then cache policy, and some allow origin and keep alive. So let's set these headers first. They are really important for server sent events. So how does it work? Header dot set. So the most important header is content type, which is text event stream. So this is really important for server sent events. Another one would be cache control, so, which is no cache, so just uh, saying to our client that there is nothing to cache. And another one would be uh, to keep connection live, so that's, uh, we can use the connection header for that, and the value would be keep alive. 
Another maybe optional header I would set is, and depending on your environment, is to set the course settings. So allow origins, for example, so there are no errors. So simply for local environment, I'll just allow all the origins. So do header set. So that would be, if I remember, access, control, allow origins or origin. I believe it's singular and all of them. So now our headers are set, but we are not sending any response back. So let's do it in so-called event loop. So um, we'll have few tickers, uh, let's say one for memory updates and one for CPU uh, starts updates and send them in this loop. So let's define our, let's say memory ticket as I believe it's time, new ticker, let's do every second. And don't forget to stop the ticker when we are done. So we can do mmt.stop uh, deferred. And let's do the same for our CPU updates later. Also every second. And here in select, we can then Kind of receive these ticks and act accordingly. For example, case um, memt dot uh, I think it's C, and then so do something here, and then the same in um, CPU the same. So send some CPU updates here. Also, we can monitor if a client has disconnected or not. Um, by using also a channel, uh, let's say client gone, um, was that um, so request context done, and also add it to our select. Oops. If client is gone, we can maybe just log that. Client has disconnected, so we'll be able to test that later. And for monitoring memory and CPU, I'll be using this famous package Go PSUtil, which is a Go implementation of PSUtil. Um, specific, specifically, we'll be using the functions like mem.virtualmemory and then I believe it's cpu.times to get the uh, CPU stats. Um, yeah, so let's import this package, so memory sub package and CPU one. So I already executed go get, so I don't need to do that. It's in my go mode files, uh, but you might have to do that beforehand. So now in memory section, um, we can get memory using mem virtual memory, which can give us an error. So maybe let's just simply um, just print it, print it. And once we get our memory information, we can then uh, send some response. So we'll be using fmt fprintf to the writer. So our writer would be now a response writer from here, and then I uh, know oh now it is a format. So I'll just type it, but then I'll explain it later in a bit. And there is some data um, and slash n slash n. So when we go back to our doc documentation, we can see that there are four fields that can be sent together with the message. And each message has to be separated by two new lines and each field with a single new line. And these are optional. So uh, event is uh, telling us which a type of the event we are sending. So it's optional. We can send maybe for memory, we'll be sending one event type for CPU another. So I'll be using that. Uh, data is the required one. So that's the data of your message. Um, you can just send a string. You can format it as a JSON. Uh, which is a little bit more suitable, so then you can parse it better on the client side. 
Um, there is a unique ID of the event and retry connection time. So for, for this example, we'll, we'll be using the first two. So let's go back to the code and see how to do that. So actually, if it's already formatted fprint, so we can do directly here, for example, total memory, uh, I think it's integer, then used integer, and maybe percentage would be a flow to is two floating points, so uh, like that, and maybe a percentage, right? And now we can set it as, so total would be m dot total, then m dot used, and then m dot um, used percent. Correct. Now it can return an error, so let's check that. Actually, let's just return this so we don't continue to do the same here. Unable to, to write, for example. Um, and yeah, but also um, we can use this thing called response uh, controller. So let me introduce it here. So in HTTP package, there is this uh, response controller thing that um, I believe it's new response controller on on W, right? And we can use something like RC dot flush then. So to actually send the data um, over the pipe. Cool. So this part is ready. Let's now implement the same, but for the CPU, right? So it's a um, kind of separate ticker here, and I believe it's CPU dot times. And if you want to get it per CPU, you just do it false and get the total one. Change few messages here. Change the event type now to CPU and change the data, right? And in the data, we can set um, for example, user, um, maybe system and idle. Now, since we are requesting for uh, kind of the a total uh, stats, so that will be in the first argument uh, of the first element of the array. Um, user, so that's the float. So maybe we do dot do. And same here, so dot f, and then idle as well. Um, yep. Um, so system and idle, and the rest is the same. So again, we flash our response controller. Yep. I believe this code should be working. So let's just quickly run it to see if it doesn't fail. Mm. Think that works. Now let's go and implement the client side, which we'll do in uh, JavaScript. So I'll create the, let's say, vanilla HTML file and uh, we'll connect to our server from there. And now we can create a simple HTML page with few HTML elements um, to display our data. So um, I think that's talk type HTML, HTML. Um, I hate this, by the way, but uh, what are we doing here? Um, let's, yeah, let's start with memory, maybe in some span. Um, let's give it ID so then we can access that. And then one for CPU, something like that. Right, and then kind of there define our JavaScript. That's JavaScript, right? So the first thing we need to do is to create the instance of the event source interface. So event source equal, we just can use const here. All right, so we can do new event source and give it our server address. I believe 
it's ADAT slash events. There are some optional parameters that we can send uh, here, but we don't need them. So we can use something like event source dot on message to get all the messages from the server. Or we can specify which messages do we want, or I mean, which events do we want. And that's what we, we are doing in our case. We have two separate event types. So we can do add event listener, and the first one would be memory. I believe it's something like that, right? And we'll do the same for the CPU. Now, here we want to get this event data, right, and update the uh, stats in this span uh, for the memory. So let's first define this uh, HTML elements, let's say mems equal um, document, get element by id mem. It's actually interesting why I don't have any suggestions here in my Z editor. Um, yeah, maybe I have to read some documentation or ask them. Now here we can do something like mem.text content equal. And that's here how we access our event fields. So event.data. In our case, it's a simple string, so we don't need any uh, parsing here. We also don't use ID here, so uh, simply that. And then for the CPU event type, we'll do CPU text content uh, equal event data. All right, now we can start our server. And open this index.html in the browser, for example. Cool. And as you can see, it updates every second. It updates two rows here. Um, what's also interesting, let's see if I go and stop the go backend. So going to the server, stop it, go back. And it doesn't crash. Obviously, it doesn't update because there are no events being sent. But I go back and start it again. Go back to the browser. And right, it reconnects and again kind of pulls the new data, which is quite cool. Now, on the client side, it's also possible to handle errors and to see if there are any errors. So let's do that as well. So also on the event source instance, there is event source on error. Um, yeah, and we can simply, I don't know, maybe console log in this case. Um, or SSE, maybe error, something like that, right? Uh, yeah, and that's it in terms of code. You see, uh, quite straightforward JavaScript, uh, not so hard to follow, I hope, Go. And we use only a standard library HTTP package. Um, we used Go PS Util for the memory and CPU, but that's just our use case. Cool. So servers and events provide an efficient and straightforward way to implement real-time server-to-client communication in web applications. Now you can go and develop dynamic progressive web apps with little overhead and complexity. Um, obviously, pay attention to things like load balancing, proper error handling when you deploy uh, things like that to production. I mentioned multiple use cases uh, before, but if you use it differently, please share in the comments below or other application that you built that used servers and events. I would appreciate it. And that's it for today. Thanks. Bye.